and the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Gentlemen, welcome. I was going to go straight to Las Vegas, but Mark, I am again struck by these uh, moving stories, this last one by William, about people struggling with addiction. It, no, every one of them, Judy. William tonight, uh, Paul Solomon last night. I mean, it's it just it, putting a human face on it, uh, not, not simply the, the affliction uh, and the problem, but uh, in, in the recovery. I mean, it's, a, it, it's the gravity of the problem is, is driven home to you, but the hope for recovery is, uh, is presented. We have a lot of emergencies, I guess, David, to deal with, but this is clearly one. That's yeah, out there. well, the scene of Roxanne Newman uh, with her date on the first date, yeah. A, the way the spirit with which she told that story, and then her husband's grace, yeah. uh, or now husband's grace, it's uh, remarkable. And she, her, her point, which is the one you hear over and over again, is it's just a slow motion form of suicide. Mm -hmm. And you got to see it first, the heroism of the people who are trying to deal with the recovery, but the social chasm that causes it. Suicide is just a symptom of isolation. And the tearing of the social fabric has created so many problems for society, but this is the, the one that is the most lethal. Well, speaking of lethal and social fabric, Mark, uh, Las Vegas has been on all of our minds this week, the worst mass shooting in American history. Um, what does it say about our country, about our, the American people? Well, it, it, it says, again, uh, that we have uh, a problem that the rest of the world doesn't 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 face, has dealt with in in different way, and uh, it 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 quite frankly, Judy, is uh, uh, beyond my comprehension at this point. I mean, we as a as a people, uh, if you think about it, over the last generation, have made such enormous strides in the changes we've made. If, for example, alcohol-related driving deaths are down by 85 percent. Uh, a generation ago. People took for granted smoking in hospitals, in schools, in offices, in right. stores. And we've done and put seat belts on children. 90% of Americans drive with seat belts, and half of those who die are the 10% who don't wear seat belts. And we've done that. We've made these changes. I mean, and we've taken on major economic interests. And this is the one that has stumped us. Um, and uh, you know, is a, to, to organize social action and a social movement around it because there are majorities, uh, you know, not intense majorities, but majorities of people who favor measures that uh, have, have broad backing uh, on registration, on, on background check. On, uh, we do it with automobiles. We do it with every other kind of device. And it, it, but somehow, uh, again, we've been stumped. And David has a theory on it, uh, which he wrote about today quite uh, persuasively, uh, which uh, you know may very well uh, may very well explain it. Well, I always have a theory. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me about the polling on people's guns rights or gun control is that in 2000, not that long ago, two-thirds of Americans supported gun control and only 29% supported gun rights. Now it's about 50-50. And so the gun rights people have just had a massive shift in their direction. And that's because the issue has now perfectly mirror, mirrors the political divide in this country and the cultural divide between coastal and rural, between more uh, uh, higher education, lower education, the divide we see on issue after issue. And it's become sort of a, a proxy for the big cultural dispute. And a lot of the people who are trying to resist the, the post-industrial takeover of the country have seized on guns and immigration and the flag and a few other issues as the issues on which they're going to rally their people. And there are a lot of those people. Four, one in four households has a gun in this country. And so it's become a symptom of a larger culture war between some people who think it's horrific guns and some people think it's a symbol of families being responsible and taking care of themselves, of freedom, and of Americanness. It's a reminder of something Barack Obama said. At one I, I wouldn't say guns cling bitterly, though. I, I, you know, I think I disagree with that. Uh, they s see it as a way that, that America should be what it should be. Mark, the debate or the discussion this week, so much of it has turned to guns. Is that the conversation we should be having right well, now? Well, it's, it's the conversation we, we have to have because this man was a, was a one-man artillery. I mean, he had 12 rifles uh, in, his, uh, in his possession in the hotel, in the suite that was comped to him, let it be noted, because he was a major gambler. 
um, and that, that's what Las Vegas does. If you're going to bet enough at the tables or at video poker, you're going to get a free suite, and then nobody's going to ask questions about you. But they were fitted out with bump stocks, Judy, which are a little device that turns it essentially into a lethal killing weapon. Uh, and that's all it is, to kill human beings. It's not for hunting, it's not for sportsmanship or anything else. Uh, there seems to be an emerging consensus on that, that we, we have to limit those, that they limit sales. Uh, even the NRA and, and Republicans have done it. Um, I, I hate to sound like a cynic, uh, but uh, the, these are made in Moran, Texas, uh, by a fellow who started the company six years ago. They don't have a political action committee. They don't have billions of dollars in, in contributions. Uh, and I think, I think it's a good idea, the positive public policy, that they are limited. But, I mean, he's, he's not a, a, you're not dealing with a political powerhouse when you outlaw his product. Yeah. But does it look like, I mean, you wrote today, David, the prospects are dim for figuring this uh, gun issue out. But is there any hope? Well, I think they are, Dim. I mean, we've, we're in the middle of a renaissance of gun laws in this country. 24, more than 24 states have passed it, and almost all of them have loosened gun restrictions, not tightened gun restrictions. Uh, they conceal carry and all those kinds of laws. My own view on the issue is that we should probably pass all the gun uh, control measures that are talked about, whether it's the gun shows, whether it's the limiting the number That's you can right. buy. And I mean, you could, there's a list of about 15 programs, the smart guns and all that, and most of them would be good. And I think they would be good because I think they would reduce suicides, which is really the main form That's of gun death. Uh, whether they would prevent these kinds of killings, I guess I'm dubious. Marco Rubio um, made a statement in the presidential campaign that none of the proposed laws would have prevented any of the recent mass killings. The Washington Post uh, did a big fact check on that claim, and they said what he said was accurate. And so, you know, I, I'm for supporting these things. I'm not sure we should get our hopes up they'll prevent things. One of the things I've been thinking about is if we in the media just stop talking about these people. Yeah. You know, this guy would seem to be, an, I, we don't know what he is, but a lot of the people who, who do this, they just want to become famous. They want to prove to the world they exist. And if we anonymize them, and it's hard to do because you're always curious about the people, right. but if we anonymize them, I think that would, I'm not saying this is in replacement of gun rules, but I'm saying this, to me, is a thing that we can do. Judy, two-thirds of all the veterans who commit suicide do so by firearms. I mean, one of the... Military think, veterans. Yes, military veterans. And I, I just think one of the things we have to face is that this is going to require a social movement. I mean, just as, just as tobacco did, just as drunk driving has, I mean, it, it's going to require a social movement, and it's going to require the face of people like David Petraeus and Stanley McChrystal, former generals, who have come out for limiting these weapons. I mean, it's going to require that sort of... that, you, that it is a patriotic, that it is a... Uh, fully red-blooded thing to, yeah. to limit and control. I think that that's a crucial point. You know, uh, too often the people who have been the spokesperson of the yep. gun control have been Michael Bloomberg and, frankly, Jimmy Kimmel. And I like Michael Bloomberg, I like Jimmy Kimmel's show, but they shouldn't be the face because the, everybody's cultural awareness is get up when it's a New York mayor or a Hollywood star. Yeah. And it's got to come from the people who, are, who own guns in this country. That's right. And you are starting to see some conservatives, some Republicans saying, we need to at least look at these bump fire stocks. The president, Mark, uh, was out, it, it went to Las Vegas, but also went to Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. where, you know, we continue to watch very slow progress. Only, what is it, one out of every ten households has power. Right. Only half the, the island has, has water. He got into another verbal back and forth with the mayor of San Juan. Separately, we know he's now uh, very unhappy with his secretary of state, Rex Tillerson. Um, there's conflict here and conflict there. What do we make of all this at this point? Well, I mean, Puerto Rico was a, was a disaster. I mean, what you're looking for is a time like this is a consoler in chief, a comforter in chief, someone who provides encouragement and hope to people, uh, who rises above, who delivers empathy. Uh, Donald Trump is just not naturally an empathetic person. He just isn't. He cannot abide criticism. He went after personally the mayor of San Juan, uh, who was sleeping in a cot while he was sleeping in a country club uh, and uh, enduring all of the uh, the hardship. Uh, and and he treated Puerto Ricans, Judy. Uh, I, I just point out who are Americans, uh, nine of whom have won the Congressional Medal of Honor in service, 223,000 of whom have served in American wars uh, in, in, as American citizens. And he treated them as sort of a foreign 
uh, soil. I mean, that they, they were they were not they were not deserving. Uh, and I thought that the Tillerson thing is uh, I don't think there's any question. I mean, he he scolded publicly the chief diplomat of the United States, uh, Secretary of State, for practicing diplomacy, uh, for dealing in uh, trying to defuse. Uh, a potential nuclear conflagration in the in Asia, uh, and said that you're wasting your time by doing it. I mean, I don't know that, that this marriage cannot be saved. This is the th that's my question, David. This is the third, I guess, member of his cabinet. He's been unhappy with. They went ahead yeah. and you know Tom Price left. Yeah. Health and Human Services. But we Usually know Friday afternoons is like the best <laughs> time for <laughs> these guys. Six thirty. So <laughs> we're, we're doing okay so far. Uh, you know, this is totally serious to me. You know what Donald Trump said today about. The calm before the storm. Oh, We're not saying what it's about, but one has to think North Korea. That's a chilling statement to make. And so you're really looking who, as Bob Corker, the senator from Tennessee, said this week, who can prevent chaos? And uh, uh, Mattis and Tillerson are the are the two big ones right now, and John Kelly. Mm -hmm. And so Tillerson's has gotten ex to put a kindly mixed reviews, Secretary of State, even if you take Donald Trump away. But he seems to be someone who at least can keep us out of nuclear war. And so to me, him resigning, if they could get a John Kelly in there, that might be, that would be good. Another pr a protector against chaos. But if Trump picks someone who's an inciter of chaos, of his worst instincts, then it would be worse. And so to me, this is, you know, sort of a life or death issue for, uh, yes. uh, of whether we can surround Trump with enough people who can resist his, whatever is going through his brain on this subject. And then questions about whoever would replace him if he were to leave, although this is in the realm of speculation, though, Mark. No, it, it is, but I, I don't think there's any question, Judy, that his time is, is limited. I mean, certainly his effectiveness. Tillerson. Tillerson. Yeah. I mean, sadly, he gets very bad reviews inside the building. I mean, the morale, the State Department. Uh, it, A the, lot of jobs the, not filled. Not filled, and, and just people felt, feeling that he has not stood up for the for the department and its mission um, in addition. But there's no question, he and, and General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, have a very close, and General Kelly, have a very close working relationship. And uh, I would hate to see General Kelly leave as White House Chief of Staff. We are uh, no shortage of things to look at this week. We're looking for something uplifting. Yes. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you both.